I got a question. How many of you saw the movie Top Gun? Remember Top Gun from back in the day? Okay, so that movie came out when I was 16 years old. And if you remember the first scene, there's a scene where Tom Cruise, he's flying the plane, he's going to land on an aircraft. And it's a really intense scene. And he doesn't look like he's going to make it, and then he nails it. You guys remember that? Okay, so ever since I saw that first scene, landing on an aircraft carrier was the number one thing on my bucket list. It was the number one thing I wanted to do. And then two years ago, I actually had the opportunity to do it. So I was called, I was invited by the Navy to spend two days with the captain of a ship, commander of a fleet, to basically travel and, and walk around and, and like follow him for 24 hours and learn how he leads a 5,000 person ship so we can share it with other people. So I'm totally fired up. Like this is the number one thing on my bucket list. Until I realized I am totally afraid to fly. And to get there, I was going to actually have to fly in this thing to get to the aircraft carrier. So I developed a plan. And the plan was I was going to go to the base early. I was going to go to Coronado early. And I was going to meet my pilot. And I thought this person, probably flying for a long time, would really give me confidence and things like that and instill it in me. And, and I'd feel fine. So I get to Coronado early. And I go and I ask my pilot. He comes out. This kid looks like he's 14 years old. And I asked him, I said, I have a question. I said, how many times, I told him I'm a little bit nervous, I said, how many times have you landed on an aircraft carrier? And he said this, 86 times. I said, 86 times, that's awesome. So what that means is every time you land on a carrier, like you're not nervous, this is, he said, sir, I'm going to stop you right there. Every time I land on an aircraft carrier, I am absolutely terrified, <laughs> which wasn't what I wanted to hear. And then he said, maybe now's a good time for me to give you the three scenarios. And I'm like, the three scenarios? Nobody told me about scenarios. He said, here they are. Scenario number one is this. Scenario number one is we're going to fly out for about three hours over the Pacific. We're going to be off the coast of Mexico. And he said, when we spot the ship, we're going to be given permission to land. From that time, we have 14 seconds to go along the side of the ship, turn the plane around, line up with the, line up with the deck, and land. He said, here's the thing. This is not going to feel like a southwest landing. He said, that ship is moving forward. It's rocking side to side, and it's bobbing up and down. And we have to match and mirror that movement in the plane. And he said, scenario number one is we come down. And by the way, if you saw the movie Top Gun, there's a hook that falls off the, the end of the, air, uh, of the plane. And that's going to hook the trap or a wire on the deck. And that's what makes you stop. He said, here's the problem. We only have three feet margin of error, and that thing's three inches off the ground. So we're going to do what we call a controlled crash. I'm like, what? He said, here's what we're going to do. If we do this right, we're going to come down. We're going to hit the deck. You're going to hear metal scraping across metal, and we're going to hook the wire. And he said, if we do this right, you're going to get out of the plane. You're going to have a great 24 hours. I'm like, what? He said, that's scenario number one. He said, scenario number two is this. Scenario number two is we come in, and he said, and we miss the wire. He said, then things get tricky. I have two and a half seconds to understand that I've missed the wire, get the plane up, off the deck, because if I don't, because of my speed, I'm going to go over the other side into the water, which leads to scenario number three. That's a water landing. And he said, we'll tell you all about that once we get you strapped in. So here's what happens. So we go out, and we're flying on the plane. And he said, oh, by the way, one more thing. 10 seconds before we land, I'm going to yell brace. He said, put your hands like this and brace for that crash. All right, so here we go. So we're on our first trip out. We line up. We're going, boom, 10 seconds out. He yells, brace. We come in, and we miss. We go back up. We go around. Second time around. Picture this, 25-foot swells that day. That's how much we're rocking. Second time we come in, brace. We brace for a crash. We come in. And we missed again. We go back around. I am terrified. Third time. Third time's a charm, right? Not for us. He comes in, <laughs> and he misses again. And the fourth time, he nails it. Now, I don't know about you guys, but to me, that feels like every single day as an entrepreneur. Like, you may go in perfectly. You may have the perfect idea, the perfect plan. You may execute flawlessly. And you come in for some reason, you miss. And you have to get back up, and you have to try it all again. And you miss, and you have to try it again until eventually you nail it. 
And what I love about Sage Talks, what I love about what Brian and Jerry are doing, what I love about all of you being here is that you're absolutely committed to trying to help each other nail it the first time. And so I want to thank you guys for having me here because I love, I love what it is that you guys are doing. So you were mentioning, Stacey, I've had kind of an interesting career. I've had an opportunity to work for people like Tony Robbins and Richard Branson and some other incredible entrepreneurs in between in good times and bad times. And I've always asked myself two questions. Two questions being around these people. And the first is this. The first is, what is the difference? What is the difference that makes the difference between number one in any, in any industry, the number one, the best person, and everyone else? And here's what I've learned. Whether it's being in deals with these people today, or I work with Entrepreneur Magazine, interviewing these people all over the world, people like Gary Vee and Damon John and Sarah Blakely, asking these people, what is, what is the one thing, your secret sauce, what do you do? And what I found is they all have the same answer today, and it's this. They have got this crazy obsession, this ridiculous passion, this just like this, it is, it is a crazy passion for learning. And here's why. It used to be the time and innovation moved relatively slowly. In fact, it was linear, wasn't it? Right, the pace of change was slow. But today, technology's changed everything. The pace of innovation today, it's exponential. And that's what these top performers know. Think about it this way. In 1919, 100 years ago, the average man in the US lived, lived to be 49 years old. I'm 49 years old. That freaks me out. But maybe back then, being good at one thing was good enough. But that's not going to work today. Take a look at last year's graduating college class. In 2018, the top 10 jobs that college graduates applied for did not exist. They did not exist 10 years ago. And if we look into the future, let's talk about entrepreneurs. Last year, 2018, the government stated there were 34 million people that could be classified as entrepreneurs in the United States. Now, with the coming recession, when the market corrects, with automation, with AI, with robotics, that number is expected to change. Within 15 years, the number of entrepreneurs is going to go from 35 million to 79 million in the United States alone. So I'm here today to tell you this. I'm here today to tell you that whatever it is that makes you you, that one thing that you're great at, your secret sauce, that silver bullet that you have, your superhero power five years ago is your baggage today. And that is what the top performers know. So they have this obsession for learning and this ability to adapt. The other thing I've always asked myself is these people that just seem to hit it and hit it again, success after success. Are they lucky or are they smart? And one of the things I've learned is this. They are, luck they are smart enough to know when it is that they're getting lucky. They trust their intuition more than anyone else around. And when they trust their intuition, they hire the best teams and they execute like crazy. And so what I'd love to share with you in the short time that I have is this. I'd love to share with you five of the most powerful lessons that I've learned being around these top performers. And the first is this to learn how to buy a rainforest. To learn how to buy a rainforest. And here's what I mean. A few years ago, I was invited by Richard Branson to his home on Necker Island. And it was when the market was, was kind of crazy in 2008. He had a CEO summit. He brought 35 of us there. And I remember I was so excited to go and to learn. I'd always heard about this place. And on the first night when it was time for dinner, they asked all of us to come from the great house down to the beach. Because Richard not only owned the island that we were staying on called Necker, but he had just bought the island right next door called Mosquito. Because I guess if you're going to own one island, you might as well own the one next door, right? So here's what we did. We ended up getting in these little boats, and they took us pitch dark night to that Mosquito Island, and there was nothing on it, literally nothing. And we went around the back corner, and there was this lone strip of beach, and what he had done is set up this incredible barbecue. And so we got out, I grabbed my plate, and I was looking for a place to sit. And I saw Richard, he was cross-legged sitting on the beach, and he was on the phone, he was negotiating a deal. Nothing like you see in the media. So intense. And it seemed like everybody else knew what it was he was trying to buy except for me. And so I walked over and I said, hey Richard, 
when he got off. I said, what is it that you're trying to buy? And he said this, the rainforest. And I said, the rainforest, which one? He said, the Amazon. Because I guess if you're going to buy a rainforest, you might as well buy the biggest one, right? He was on with the head of Brazil. And I said, Richard, by the way, one thing I've learned working with big thinkers like this is never tell them anything is impossible. And in that moment, what came to my mind right away is I looked at him as I said, Richard, that's impossible. And he looked at me stone cold in the eye and he said to me this. He said, you want to learn how to buy a rainforest? I'm going to teach you how to do it. And he said this, if you want to do anything great in life, where is it that you have to start? You have to start with your why. Why is it that you're doing this? Because building anything great is going to be hard. It's going to be really hard. And if you're not truly committed, you're not truly rooted in why it is that you're doing this, when times get tough, it's too easy to quit. And we knew Richard's why. Richard's why was protecting the forest and the indigenous animals. And he said, if that's my why, do I really need to purchase and own the rainforest, or could I just lease it? Now, to me, that was a huge shift in thinking. I said, you can lease it. He said, and by the way, if you got me in the room with a willing seller, do you think I could negotiate a good deal? I said, I would bet on you. He said, great. How are we going to finance it? And I remember the people that were sitting around, the people around this group, they were like, well, what about this person? Like, giving out the names of people that had billions of dollars of net worth thinking they'd have the same why and would contribute. And Richard put up his hand and he waved it like this. He said, no, no, no. He said, what if it didn't matter? What if it didn't matter if you gave a dollar or a dime? Effectively, crowdsourcing by the Amazon rainforest. And here's my point. In less than five minutes, buying the rainforest seemed easier than eating my bowl of soup. And what I learned in that moment is this. What I learned in that moment is if you have big vision, if you have the right mindset, you put the right people and resources around you, you can achieve virtually anything that you dream. Which leads to point number two. You have a big vision. Where do you start? You start with one hammer and one nail. And what do I mean? Let's say I was to give you one hammer and one nail. And your job's simple. All you have to do is bring that hammer back and drive that nail into a piece of wood. Like really nail that one business. Now, the odds are you're going to miss the first, the second, the third time, but eventually, I'm going to bet that you'll nail it. So let's say I give you two hammers and two nails. You've got a problem. You've got to hold two hammers. Who's going to hold the nails? Let's say you find somebody crazy enough to do it. Think about this. You have to bring both hammers back at the same time, and you have to strike at the same time. And the odds are you're going to miss the first, the second, the third time. You may never get it right. Let's say I give you 10 hammers and 10 nails. You get the point. You see, the biggest mistake that entrepreneurs make is they focus on too many things at once. And so what I say is this, don't focus on everything, focus on one thing. Really nail that one thing and then move to the next. Which leads to point number three. And point number three is institute a five-year-old Friday into your business. Institute a five-year-old Friday into your business. And here's what I mean. So I have a good friend, his name is Jeff Hoffman. And Jeff started a company called Priceline.com. You guys know Priceline.com, $90 billion market cap at one time. So um, Jeff and I, we end up speaking at a lot of the same events. And so we see each other backstage. And we both have young daughters. And so we bond and we talk over that. And so about a year ago, I was backstage with Jeff. And he said to me, Scott, let me tell you this story. I said, what? He said, check this out. I instituted a bring your kid to work day at my company. And he said, on that first day, I was going to bring my daughter. And so we got the car ready. She was all excited. She got in the back seat. She buckled in. And she was five years old. Now, if any of you know anything about five-year-olds, five year olds, that's their why phase. They ask why about everything. So she gets buckled in the car. He puts the key in the ignition. And she starts. She says, Dad, she said, I have a question. What is the name of that piece of plastic that's between the, the, the back window and the front window? That piece of plastic, what do you call that? And he said, I don't know. And she said, why? And he said, I don't know. And she said, why? I don't know why. He says, honey, I, I don't know. But actually, I think there isn't a name for that thing. They just don't have a name. And like a good five-year-old, she says this. Well, dad, how do they know what to call it when they have to order more? So he turns on the car, and they head to the office. And she keeps going. She says, Dad, how do they make carpet? And he says, I don't know. 
And she says, why? Well, I don't know why. They get to the office. They walk through the office, and there's these two big machines in the lobby. And they get to Jeff's thing, and she sits down in a chair, and she looks at him, and she says, Dad, what are those two big things in the office when we walk through it? And he says, I don't know. And she says, why? And he says, I don't know. And she says, why? And he goes, wait, why don't I know what those things are? So he calls his office manager. And he said, hey, what are those two things in the front? And the office manager said, I don't know. And he said, why? He said, I don't know. He said, but I'm going to find out today. So he sent out an email to everybody on the floor. And guess what? Nobody knew. And they said, why? So they sent an email out to everybody in the company. What are those two things? Nobody knew. So he said, why? End of the day, the guy comes in. He says, Mr. Hoffman, he said, I have good news and bad news. He said, the good news is we're going to have those machines picked up today. The bad news is that those are paper collators. And we've been paying them for them for seven years. And no one in this company even knows what they do. And so the next day, that was a Friday, the next Monday, Jeff instituted a policy in all of his companies where once a month they do what they call five-year-old Fridays, where everybody's job is to do one thing. Their job is to ask why. Be a five-year-old again and ask why you do what you do. Challenge everything that you know. Be flexible, open, and adaptable. That first day, the first five-year-old Friday, one of the things that they learned is they learned that, um, that uh, they were sending out reports to people in the mail. And they called their customers, and their customers didn't even know they sent them anymore because they just look at email. Just by canceling those paper reports, they saved $780,000 on the first day in that one department. So that's my challenge to you, is to challenge everything that you do, to ask why and to be open to whatever the answer is and flexible and honest with yourself. And the last thing is this, because we're running out of time. The last thing is to keep your eyes up and on the horizon. Keep your eyes up and on the horizon. Here's what I mean. A couple years ago, actually about a year ago, I went and I took uh, race car driving lessons. And I did this in Las Vegas. And I remembered something I always wanted to do. And I thought I wanted to learn how to drive. And that's what I learned. But I, I actually probably learned more about business than I did driving on that day. And here's how it happened. When we first got started, we sat down in the car, and there was an instructor who sat next to me. And that instructor sat in an angle and put their hand up against the wheel. And the idea was, if they had to make corrections, they'd make minor corrections, I wouldn't even notice that they were there. And when we first started, he said this. This is your first lesson. Keep your eyes up on the horizon. See where it is that you want to go down the road, and stay focused there. Now, at five miles an hour, at 10, at 50 miles an hour, keeping your eyes up and on the horizon, that's an easy thing to do. But what happens? The faster you go, the faster life comes at you. In your business, the more comes at you. What happens is you take your eyes off the horizon and you start to focus on what's right in front of you. As a driver, what you do is you look like literally over the hood, over the hood of your car. If you're a skier, it's called looking over the tips of your skis. And so what happens as a driver is you see every pebble bumping, and you start to make these quick and quirky adjustments. Now, at five miles an hour doing this isn't going to hurt you. At 200 miles an hour doing this is going to take you into the wall and into a crash. So that's what leads to the second lesson. And the second lesson, I think the coolest lesson, is learning how to crash. And here's what they do. You're driving along the track. And when it looks like you feel comfortable, that person next to you who has their hand near the wheel, what they're going to do is they're going to actually wrap their hand around it, and they're going to tug just a little bit. And what happens? You freak out. And what happens when things feel uncomfortable, when life happens, when things change like this, what happens? The first thing that we focus on is what we fear most. And as a race car driver, what that means is your eyes go right to the wall. But watch what happens. When your eyes go right to the wall, it pulls your head, which pulls your shoulder, which turns your hand, that takes you into the wall. And so the instructor has one more thing that they have to do. As soon as they tug, they put their hand back on your helmet. And what happens is your eyes go back to the road, which takes your head, which pulls your shoulder, and gets you out of the crash. 
So no matter what's happening in your life, do everything that you can to keep your eyes up and on the horizon. Be around people. Put yourself around people that will help you to rise and keep your eyes up and on the horizon. And I'm confident if you do that, you will be on your way to creating something magical in your business in 2020. You guys, thank you for having me here.